The 417 Gamers is a group of board, tabletop, and card gamers in the 417 area code. This is the podcast. Welcome to the 417 Gamer Podcast, episode 11, The One with Teaching. In this episode, Andrea and I talk about four things that we have enjoyed or are looking forward to in the 417 area. For the one topic of the week, Catherine from Moon City Con of 417 Gamer, she stops by and we talk about teaching games. Then in the seven, we talk about seven of our favorite games to teach. Let's get on with the 417 Gamer Podcast. Welcome to the 417 Gamer Podcast, episode 11. My name's Rick. I'm Andrea. The four in the 417 Gamers on the regular episode. We discuss four things we are looking forward to in the 417 area or that we enjoyed in the 417 area. Uh, I'll go first. This is not necessarily in the 417 area, but I'm looking forward to SummerSlam. I'm we're, After going and seeing WrestleMania with some friends... Went to the Royal Rumble in St. Louis a, a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. Watching some AEW, got the new AEW video game. We went to a local independent wrestling show. Here in the 417. Yes. Uh, Mid-States Wrestling. That was a fun time. In fact, they're going to have a show in August on the 12th. Yes. Uh, back at Relics. Yep, that? at Relic Event Center. Uh, I won't be in town, or we'll be busy that weekend. Um, but SummerSlam is on the... When is that? It's this One, two, three, weekend. four. Is it the fifth? Friday the fifth? Mm-hmm. It's Saturday the fifth. Yes. It's a Saturday. Whatever the first Saturday of August is, that's SummerSlam. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to travel up to St. Louis, uh, grill some meats, watch some wrestling, maybe play a game or two. Mm-hmm. We'll see. We'll see. And then come back and um, be, you know, drive late, tired, sleeping on the Sunday. Yes. But it should be a good time. What are you looking forward to, Andrea? I am looking forward to my birthday. Yeah. My birthday. Um, my birthday's in August. And it is. Rick has several surprises uh, yeah, yeah, waiting right. for me. I keep being told, keep this day open, keep that day open. Yeah, don't worry about so it. So it's, um, it's very exciting. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm ready. Hey. Uh, one thing I enjoyed in the 417 area... And, and I don't want to say anything more about your birthday because I'm bad about talking too much. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to let anything slip. Well, let's so. talk a little more about it. No. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> Suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> uh, we went to the Missouri Institute of Natural Sciences. It's on the southwest side of town uh, over by Rivercut Golf Course. Mm-hmm. And they have a 40% complete uh, triceratops named Henry. Yes, they do. I think it's the, the biggest one in North America from what they were saying. Yes, the largest one. Uh, they also have um, a mastodon skull. Mm-hmm. Um, they have tons of like local fossils, so trilobites, crinoids, mm-hmm. some of the, the, the spinny snail shells. Uh, they have a diplodocus like jawbone. They have some prehistoric crocodile skulls. Mm-hmm. They have some cool stuff out there. Really cool stuff. We... Um... And it's free. I yes. was surprised. It was just to go in normally a museum, you know, with that quality of uh, exhibits uh, charges a fee, but no. And we went on a Saturday afternoon, and there were more, there was quite a few people there. Yep. Um, so we absolutely recommend it. Um, the the tri- do take donations. Yeah. Well, of course. Um, the Triceratops is um, well. If you've seen the movie. Um, Night at the museum. Yeah, they have that full Tyrannosaurus Rex that comes to life. Well, this is a full, yeah, you know, um, Triceratops, and he is huge. Yes, I mean, you know, you see him in the movies, and, and this this was a big old boy, <laughs> and uh, it's pretty impressive standing next to him. They have a big claw foot from a T Rex um, that is just massive, just to stand by, um, and it it helps. You see, you know, oh, dinosaurs are big, okay, but when you're standing right next to a fossil, you're like, yeah. wow. Um, and it was. <sighs> they have a they have a, a leg bone from a woolly mammoth that is a real. Yeah, know, leg bone. and it's as, as long as this room we're sitting in. Yeah. <laughs> it's massive. Yeah, it's got the it's got both joints. It's got kind of what you your uh, uh, shin to your thigh bone. Yeah. 
And then it's got the ball socket that would go into a hip mm-hmm. joint. And but. you were saying that soon they'll be getting another dinosaur. So I was reading on their page. They have so they have some people that graduated and volunteered at their place that have been digging in Wyoming. And they found, I don't remember the dinosaur or how to pronounce it, but it had a fin back to it. And it was like one of the more complete versions of that dinosaur and one of the largest versions. And they were talking about since the people that were heading up that uh, dig were from here, that they might get to show it first there, but we don't know. Uh, Apparently they had packed it up. uh, They still have to get the cases in, the bones in. Then unpack them, catalog them, sure. make sure they, they have all the stuff they need to. And then, I don't know how long it takes to form one of those yeah. you know, fossil. You know, right. uh, because when, um, like the Triceratops was 40% complete, um, they fill in the rest with um, fabricated pieces. Casts, yep. Yeah, um, casts of bones. So it looks complete, but you can obviously see which were the real bones and which were the casts. It's completely obvious. You can just see that. Oh. And it's not behind glass or anything. I mean, it's just right there. It is right There's there. There's a little rope around but, it. But don't touch. But, yeah, but with a sign that says, don't touch. And I didn't. I didn't. You wanted to. I wanted to, yeah. You wanted to ride the sucker. I did. I was like, can I get my picture on the dinosaur? No, ma'am. They said no. It was just a joke. No, it wasn't. <laughs> I really would have. <laughs> uh, one more thing that you were looking forward to or have enjoyed. I have enjoyed through... It started off as an accident. It was yeah. an accident. It was an accident. <laughs> um, but we hadn't planned on doing it. But we have played games every single day throughout the month of July. Mm-hmm. And here we are at the very end of July, and we've not missed a day, and we're not going to miss a day today either. Um, But it's been really nice. And come home every evening to just plan on, even if we've only got 30 minutes. We've got games that play in 30 minutes. Splinter Duel plays in about 30 minutes. Yeah. Namalia plays in about 20. That was what we reviewed last week, or last month. Yeah, absolutely. Or on on a weekend where we've got a full afternoon, we might play out something longer or two medium length games um but it's been really nice and we've gotten to play through more of the collection Mm -hmm. and that you have um some games that we specifically picked you know because oh we haven't played this one before right oh it's been a year since we played this game yeah well and then we i made that challenge at the front of the year that i wanted to get through our unplayed collection of those games down to single digits Mm -hmm. I think we're down to like 26 at this point. And we got four of them played, four or five of them played in in July. Uh, And some that we played a couple times, like Lorenzo El Magnifico. We played it the one time two player. We're like, okay, that's that's, that's fine. Then we played a three player and you unblock some spaces. Yeah. We also added the quote unquote advanced with the leader cards. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't play without those leader cards ever again. Made a huge difference in the gameplay. So it was fun to, because we played it um, the day before, we played it just two, well, we played it twice two player, and then we had a friend come over and we played it at three, and we're like, oh, this plays much better at three. Yep. Not that I didn't like it at two, but it would just change quite a bit. I just, I would have picked something completely, now that I know what it is at two, mm-hmm. I would pick much, much different games. So it's been really fun, it, and it wasn't that difficult. It didn't feel like a chore. We were like, oh God, we've got to get that in today. Um, it just, you know, we went for a, a, like a week and a half, two weeks where we had just happened to play a game every day and you're like, you know, we could, let's make this a thing. We'll make the whole of the month. Yeah. I think we'd gone through either nine or nine or 10 straight days. I'm like, we've gone through like nine straight days of gaming. You're like, oh really? I'm like, we, you think we can go through the whole month and add, we've got one or two days left. Yeah. And I think we're going to be able to make it. I do too. That is the four things that we have enjoyed or are looking forward to in the 417 area. Our topic of the week will be teaching games and we'll be joined by Catherine, who helps us organize and run not only Moon City Con, but the 417 Gamer Group itself. Mm-hmm. So let's get on to the one in the 417 Gamer Podcast. 417 Podcast, the one is the topic of the... the week or the month in this topic we're talking about our uh, uh, teaching games uh joining us one of the organizers from moon city con cohort mm-hmm. of 417 gamers Catherine. Welcome. hello um you and i whenever it comes to game nights 
we're some of the more predominant teachers in the group. Sure. Um, so looking at teaching, what are some what are some things that you try whenever you teach a game to hit first? Uh, what, are, what are some tips that you might be, give people? So I have, um, I'm not the best teacher. I'll say that right now because I can become rather scattered. But I think over the last 10 odd years that I've been playing games, I have gotten better based on tips other people have given me. Um, the first thing is whenever I start teaching the game, I try very hard to remember, tell people how to win the game. That's yeah. the first thing you should say. So what are we trying to accomplish with this game? What are your goals and how do you win? Mm -hmm. So that way people can keep in mind the end point of what they're trying to do and how they're trying to get there. Um, and then the other thing, games that do a good job of marrying theme to mechanics mm -hmm. really emphasize those things because if you can um, show where a game does things that's intuitive, mm -hmm. i.e. Viticulture does this very well, it the whole thing makes sense on what actions you're taking and what you're trying to accomplish as far as what the game is doing. So you really bring in the theme and, and what is happening with the game along with the mechanics because that way people have a better idea of, of how to go about doing because it just becomes intuitive at that right. point. So, Andrea, you're newer to teaching games. I am. Whenever you come at this... Um, what are some of the first things you try? And, and When I'm teaching someone newer, especially a newer into the hobby, I try and take, I understand words that you say now that I didn't understand when I first started playing games. So I feel like I do better at translating them into common speak. Um, you know, when you say a worker placement game, you know, when we, we first started playing games, I was like, I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and I think some of us drafting been, tile right. placement, yeah, I, Rondell, I who the hell knows what a Rondell right. is outside of yeah. gaming. <laughs> so I think the words that I use, I, I try and, you know, dumb it down a little, you know, I, I feel like, you know, my sentence means the same thing. It's just more, I use more common common words so i think i'm a, i'm good at translating right and, and i think quite a few of us that really get deep into the hobby forget some of that yes that we are so ingrained in the nomenclature how many times do you use the term orthogonal in real life in real life yeah <laughs> until you get into board gaming i didn't even i did not pronounce it properly <laughs> when i first started gaming right yeah um Whenever I'm, I'm in the group now, the first thing I do, and I got this from you, is have baggies set up for the players to set their boards up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is, if there's any starting monies, go ahead and clue that in the bag. Uh, their pieces, their cards, whatever, hand them the bag. That helps cover the people that are tactile learners, mm -hmm. people that, that need to get their hands dirty. We have the auditory learners. They're going to listen to you or, or tune you out eventually, whatever they're going to do. Visual learners, you've got the uh, iconography iconography if you can teach along with mm -hmm. some games i can some games i cannot um but yeah i got that from you get pieces in people's hands quicker than late mm -hmm. um longer games how do you try and keep people's attention or do you just keep on going Catherine? so you're saying a longer teach yes. a game that has a really long teach that is really um customized to who I am teaching. So one, I very much avoid teaching someone a long teach game if I don't know you. If I have a new gamer that I'm just meeting you tonight, you're getting a very, hopefully, um, easy entry game mm. um, that does not, that I don't take a 45 minute teach for. Um, if I am playing a game with, um, Ryan, for instance, who does not do well with a long 45 minute teach, well then what we might do is kind of play and learn at the same time. So mm -hmm. um, there are some people that are perfectly okay with, hey, this is a learning game. I don't need to know every single rule before I start playing. Right. If I know that about you, I'm gonna give you a very, very high level overview of this is how the game is played, mm -hmm. this is how you win, but we're going to deal in with these mechanics when we come to them. 
Um, if I have certain people who want to know every single rule before we start, um, then I try very hard to do a whole thing of you say a section, you say the next section of what you're saying, and then you go back and you repeat the first section and the second section. Mm -hmm. And then you do the third section and then you repeat mm -hmm. what you've done the previous two yes. sections. So you're kind of doing that whole almost lecture summary thing where you're saying, Repetition. okay, I've said this, mm -hmm. I'm saying this, and now we're going to go back and I'm going to say everything that I've said so that right. way you've heard it a number of times. And then mm -hmm. there's also very much, um, in addition to having the bags ready to go for people on the player pieces, if you're teaching a new game to people, really, you should have it set up before anyone sits down yes, at the table. Yes, I agree with that 100%. Do not try to teach a new game as mm -hmm. you're setting up. Yeah. Because to me, that is just... You're, you're asking for people to stop paying attention to you immediately because yeah. you're still busy. One, I can't set up a game and talk at the same time. Mm -hmm. I will screw things up. So if I know that I'm teaching a new game, I want to get to game night early. I want to have it set up and ready to go so that way I can teach it, mm -hmm. focus on the teach. Everything's out on there, which means I can also demonstrate things. Yeah, I, I agree with that too because... I like to use the, for example, if on your first turn, you want to take this piece right here. How you do that is you take a couple of these from this pile and you have to make sure you have enough of these on this board and then you're able to take that card. I right. think when people can see that at the same time that you say that, it makes more sense. It connects. Yeah. yeah. One uh, strategy I've heard that I don't use enough, I've used it a couple times, is the practice turn. Yeah. Have everybody take a practice turn and then reset. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people in our group that are very resistant to resetting after the practice turn. They're right. like, oh, we've already started. Keep on going. Especially if they're doing well. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't made any mistakes yet. We need to keep going. <laughs> right. And I, I would really like to maybe dial more of that in, especially getting into the, the medium weight games. Yeah. You know, this, is, this was a turn. You guys have all acquired resources. And if you got them into a second turn, they, they wanted to reset, man, I think it would break some of the people in our oh, game. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> that way they knew you got the resources. Now you turn them into the points. Mm -hmm. All right, start over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. It's something that I should probably try and push a little bit more mm -hmm. and maybe uh, kind of uh, teach them into liking that and then teach that way. I don't know. Well, I think you also, it, I think that's a good idea. Again, considering your crowd. So especially if you have brand new people into mm -hmm. the hobby, I think, because we've got quite a few new new yeah. gamers this past month, mm -hmm. um, that I think given that opportunity to kind of train them that, hey, this is how I learn a new mm -hmm. game is I get to play a practice round where it doesn't mean anything. I can play with something. Oh, now I get it. Yeah. Now I can play for real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. In your bag, do you do you have certain games that you like to teach to then lead them into your bigger games, or do you not even worry about that? Oh, I don't worry about that. Okay. You know me. I'll throw a new gamer right into Hansa Teutonica. I don't care. You, you'll throw them in the Lisboa. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just, just drown them. Just jump into the deep end. How'd you like it? It was okay. <laughs> Am I done? Is it over? <laughs> What are some things, some pitfalls, um, if you're not teaching and you know you're not teaching a game well, mm -hmm. do you have any tips on fixing your teach? So, so I've already started playing and I've screwed up the teach? Or if you already played the game and you realize my teach did not go well, people didn't understand what they were playing, mm -hmm. do you go back, do you reread re the rule book, do you watch some videos... Or do you just oh, so let like, somebody else teach it the next time? Oh, no, no, no. So you're saying I've I've played the game. My teach went really poorly. Everyone really didn't like the game, and it was just crap. Um, Yeah, I think I go back and I watch some more videos. Um, I don't think... As, try, as hard as I try... And overall, I would say... If I'm teaching a game that's new to me and I'm learning it to teach it, um, I used to just read the rule books or just watch a video and then I would teach it off of that. I've stopped that. Now I do both. And a lot of times, depending on the game, I might watch two or three videos yeah. and read the rule books mm -hmm. because I don't think 
I cannot think of a game that I taught properly 100% the very first time I taught it. I mean, there's always something that I get wrong. Yeah. Um, How many people get to play after the last turn is changed? Yeah, I mean... Resources, this card gets passed every round, every other round. Got passed the wrong direction. Drafting changes direction each round. Right. I mean, there's there's always little things that you get wrong. I think the... I think what makes a good teacher isn't the fact that you're not going to get any rules wrong. What makes a good teacher is understanding you might get a rule wrong and just being open and not being defensive when somebody points it out. So if somebody comes back and says, oh, no, that's wrong, be like, oh, thank you. Like, don't Mm, don't try to justify or Mm. say, oh, no, that's not don't argue at that point. Like you can look for confirmation in the rule book, Mm -hmm. but um, the biggest thing is not to have such a big ego when you're teaching that you think that you're going to get it right. Understand that you're going to get things wrong and be okay with being corrected. Mm -hmm. I think that's what makes a good teacher. And I think that came from my, my wingspan teach my first couple of wingspan teaches. I did not teach it well. I Mm -hmm. I had an idea because I watched one video on how they Mm -hmm. cut. I'm like, I can do that. Mm -hmm. And I did it and nobody was getting it. Mm -hmm. Because the way they did it was they took the action cube and they put it at the front of the row or column, depending on Mm -hmm. what action they were taking. Right. I did the same thing and the people were like, uh, so I'm like, okay, either I didn't explain it as well as he did or it was working with the people he was playing, but this Mm -hmm. is not working with the people Mm -hmm. I'm playing. Mm -hmm. So I had to dial back the wingspan teach, watch a few more videos, mm-hmm. and I think I've gotten it to where I can teach it okay, mm-hmm. but it's 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 definitely nowhere near the top ones that I like to teach. Mm-hmm. Just because, and that's that's on my ego a little bit, mm-hmm. because I was teaching so many different games, and then the wingspan that everybody else was playing just went. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, are there any styles of games that you? like to teach more than others um yeah i would say to me a worker placement is probably the easiest type of game to teach because it's very basic and it's you know okay i'm putting a worker down i'm doing a thing or getting a thing it's Mm -hmm. it's very simple to do um and then a style of game like i said earlier any game that does a really good job of marrying its theme to its um mechanic i think is it makes the game teach a lot easier Mm -hmm. and in reality any game that i love i can typically teach or any game that has a good story like if you can make a good story with a game connecting a story to your teach Mm -hmm. always makes it easier because remember in clans of caledonia every worker only gets one thing to market because they have little tiny hands and they can only carry (laughs) one little thing so um you make people laugh, it connects with them, they understand yeah. it. Because that was one game that I got the teach wrong first, is I was like, oh, I send a worker to market, I can buy and sell as much as I want. That breaks that game so <laughs> fast. You get one good for one worker. Yeah. Mm. And any style of game that you? Uh, for me, theme is everything. Everything just makes more sense to me when, you know, playing um, a game where what you're doing is something that you can mirror up with something that you already know how to do. Like she was saying, go to market, buy a good. Why can't I buy multiple goods? That's what I do in real life. Well, you have tiny hands. Okay, now I get it. (laughs) I like to be able to mirror that to something people already know how to do. Um, And and it just makes more sense along the way. Um, For me, theme is everything. Um, Like, you know, Savannah Park, you know, fire animal run away that makes sense to everyone right. you know mm-hmm. uh, so called the park storm right bears when, don't like storms well, we, we no, were at, yours does <laughs> we were at um one of our friends gary and elizabeth's and they were teaching a game and rick's like i guess you could tell by the look on my face that i just was not getting the rules and he's like is there a, a theme or a purpose to to what we're doing here and and gary's like Oh, I guess if you use your imagination. (laughs) (laughs) That's Gary speak for no. Yeah, that that was a a big no. This is Vita this is just mechanics. Right. (laughs) Although I think a lot of Lacerda games have have some some theme in it. What was No, it was Bonfire. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah a Feld game. A Feld game doesn't have steam. <laughs> no, no. It was, yeah, we had played the Lacerda and then we played the Feld. Yeah. Oh, the, I love Bonfire. I I'm sorry don't. you did not like that. Well, I just wasn't understanding sure. why we were doing what we were doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, for points. And I was like, well, yes, I get that. Well, but. no. Okay, so Bonfire's theme yeah. is actually kind of interesting because what you've done is you have this island where um, the fires have gone out. And you have to relight the fires mm-hmm. in order to attract the gods back yeah. to help the countryside. Sure. So that is the theme. Yeah. I didn't say it was a good yeah. theme, but it is the theme. <laughs> hey, Feld is like my top three, one of my top three designers. You know, sure. I love every single and Feld I, I play. Feld, yeah. And now I just like the Feld a lot. <laughs> but I will be the first to admit Feld and themes. Sure. Does not. In my Does early not board gaming, yeah. Feld and I dated, and then we decided to, like, <laughs> we'll just be friends. <laughs> Same thing with Stegmaier. Mm. For the longest time, I was like, oh, I love Stegmaier, I love Stegmaier. And the last few games that come out, I'm like, I really oh, like him. Yeah, yeah. I like him a lot. Right. He's yeah. a good guy. Yeah. <laughs> but no. Yeah. I, I don't know, I, the, the you know, a designer that I really, really admire but I don't like a lot of his stuff is Vito, uh, uh Lacerda. No. Oh. Um, Uve? No. Um, Getz? You love Through Getz. the Ages. Oh, yeah, I'm horrible with that one. Um, Codenames. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vlada Shavada. Yeah. Because he's everywhere. Yeah. He can do a party game, and then he can do an economic game. Right. He can do Bunny Bunny Moose Moose, and then Tash Kolar that's right over there, a combat game. Yeah. Right. He can do uh, Kyle's favorite game, uh, Mage Knight, mm. which is punishing either co-op or competitive. Right. And then turn right around and do Pictomania, which mm-hmm. is Pictionary-ish. Mm-hmm. Uh, closing out um, teaching. I, pay attention. Look at your, your peoples. Mm-hmm. If... If your teach is not going well and your game's not going well, are you willing to kill the game and move on to another one? Or do you stand pat, that's the game you're teaching and playing? Again, I think that depends on the people I'm playing with. I can't... I can think of one time in the last... Gosh, what year is it? 2023. So that would be 16 years. Last 16 years that I've been playing modern board gaming, that I have um, killed a game mid game because the teach went badly, and that was Arkwright at a two player game. Um, it was pain- and Arkwright's like a four hour game. So oh, yeah. like that one. Mm-hmm. You taught me Arkwright, and I liked it. Oh, it's a great I, game. I didn't like it enough to go buy my own. No, I no. Play with you. <laughs> yes. And I no. don't have to teach it when I play with you. Right. No, it's it's a great game. Totally awesome. But it was a painful teach. Probably the wrong time of night to teach it. But it was a, okay, let's just put this away and play something else. <laughs> um, but normally, I, I can't think of a game that I've had that is to the point of it's not worth completing. Um, now... There's been times that I've messed up a rule to the point where if we changed it mid-game, it would greatly hurt the dynamic of the game. Mm-hmm. And so, basically, since we played with that rule for everyone consistently, even though it changes the game, you know what? It's a learning game. Yep. We'll know better for next time. Mm-hmm. But there's we should finish the game as I as taught it. Right. And that way we can at least... It's an asterisk game. It's yeah. not a. It's not something that you learn from and you keep going. Sure. Yeah. But you do finish it. I've mm. only killed a couple games mid game because the teach haven't gone well. But I've killed games mid teach. Mm. Either they picked a game that I thought they were ready for, and mid teach they're not getting anything. Mm. I'm laying mm-hmm. down, and it could be my fault because I'm above their head in mm-hmm. my speak mm-hmm. and not relaying it, or. They're absolutely not ready. I mean, we've talked about some games where we hit a ceiling. My first ceiling game was Euphoria. Mm. First time I played Euphoria, I was not ready for that game. I didn't like it. Mm-hmm. We played it a year later mm-hmm. when everybody got their new liners, inserts, and all that stuff. I'm like, oh, this is really good. 
but that a- had been after I would played like Agricola. I think you're ready for Struggle of Empires again. No, I'm not. <laughs> I think so. That was very early on. That was very. That early was very on. early on, and, and I think you so would really like it. That we had played it at like four or five in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it was very early on. I think you would like, like it. Like Sleepy Me would have come in and kicked my ass. <laughs> being up that early. But, Catherine, thanks for coming on for yeah. the, the, the subject. We're going to hold you over and for our seven, and we'll talk about our favorite seven games to teach. The seven in the 417 Gamers is our top seven of a subject, or seven in a subject. Because mm-hmm. I told everybody, don't really worry about your organization on, just pick seven games you enjoy teaching. Uh, I'm going to start this off at number seven, and this is another Catherine Fault game. This is Hobbin Good. Yay! I, I love teaching this game. Hobbin Good is a great game to it teach. And, and I'm so happy that Aries Games is bringing it stateside for the first time ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they had some um, prototypes at uh, Origins. They had actually tried to get us a copy for Moon City Con, and production wise, they just couldn't get it to us. I was so disappointed. But I would love to reach back out and see if we can get a copy for next Moon City Con mm-hmm. and maybe even make a tournament out of oh, it. Oh, that would be a great tournament. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But, Hob and Gut, the idea is you're rich people's in a good old boys club. You're going to play eight rounds, manipulate stocks, you're going to give stocks to charity. At the end of the game, whoever's donated the least to charity is a dirty, stinking, rotten, cheap bastard and has no no way that they should be in part of your group, and they're kicked out of the club. They can't win. Then after that, whoever has the most money wins because you're rich. It's brilliant. It's I love it. It's great. The game, each round, you're going to either buy or sell three stocks. Up to. Up to. And then you're going, at the once everybody's done that, at, you have uh, card racks on either side of you, and your neighbor can see on whichever side you're sharing with them. So you each have knowledge of what the other one knows a little bit of. I know half of what my right-hand neighbor knows, and I know half of what my left-hand neighbor knows. So when you go to manipulating stocks, you are going to play a card off of each rack, one at full value and one at half value. And that manipulates the market, and you have little... Bean pots that represent the little stocks. So you got beans, rice, wheat, uh, hops, and other stuff. And then you're going to move those markers. And you're either going to make your stock worth more, or tank somebody else's stock, or potentially bot- bottom a stock out so you can make it cheaper so you can still buy stuff the next round. Exactly. It's a fantastic game. It is a great game. It is. The box is dry. The rules are dry. The teach... <laughs> The cards are dry. The, the cards are dry. <laughs> it's a fantastic mechanism. It's a fantastic game. It's a fun teach, and I I, I gleaned it off of you. Thank you for showing me how good, and it's one of my favorite teachers. I Catherine. Agree. You're number seven. I agree. And the other thing I will add about Hob and Good on why it's such a great game, it is probably my favorite sandbox game because it literally plays differently with who you're playing yes. it with. Because mm-hmm. every the game itself provides that sandbox that it's the people you play with that make the game. Mm-hmm. I have not had a bad game of Hobbin Good. Nope, neither have I. And I've lost it more times than I've won it. Because <laughs> it's, it's a great game. Oh. Yeah. All right. Uh, my, and since this is in no particular order, I'm just going to say my first contribution is going to be um, Concordia. Mm-hmm. Concordia is a great game to teach. Um, it is elegant because it is not very complicated. However, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's got the card rondelle that I am, everyone who knows me knows how much. Is, is there a rondelle in the game? Catherine will like this game. There's not many mm-hmm. things in mechanics that you can say that about, but rondelles and me, we're tight. Um, I don't know. Do you want me to go through the basics to Concordia, or are we just nope. saying the game? Just saying the game, a little, right. little spiel about it. Concordia is a fantastic game. I love teaching it. I love bringing people. And I think Concordia is a game that you don't have to have a wide knowledge base in order to oh. enjoy that game. And if you know the designer? Uh, Gex. And I think Hobbin Good is Paolo Mori? I don't remember. I don't remember either. Okay. We can look it up. <laughs> we can look it up later. later. Okay. Uh, number six. Andrea, number six. Uh, mine is Namalia. 
Um, it's just a little card game that we picked up at Geekway, and I judged a book by its cover. I was like, oh, that one looks, it's a little cute game, and I needed uh, 20 more bucks on my order to go to the next uh, coupon level <laughs> at their uh, booth table. We've never done that. <laughs> and uh, we got it home, and we let it sit on the table for a couple weeks before we opened it. We're like, hey, we should put that, that game we bought up there. And oh my gosh, we liked it so much. Yeah. And we took it to game night, and everyone liked it too. Um, based Basically, you're just uh, building a little animal preserve, and each each game is completely different because the scoring cards you randomly draw um, that come out um, are completely different. You may be getting two points for every pair of polar bears, and in the next game, if you have polar bears together, uh, you have minus points. So it's different every time, so it's complex enough that you don't get bored with it, and it's easy enough um, to to where when we take it, I can teach just about anyone, even the gateway beginners, um, because you're like, oh, the bears want to be together, or these penguins, they don't want to be by anybody else. So it's easy for me to, to turn that into that common tongue speak. Mm -hmm. so, this is designed by William uh, Levin, and it's published in the States by Lucky Duck Games. Mm -hmm. Cool. Catherine, number six. Well, I was going to say Hobbin Go is uh, Ro Rossi. Carlo Rossi. Carlo Rossi. Yeah. Hello, pa Sorry, Paula Mori. <laughs> your ethnos um all right i will go with my other one of my favorite teaches i will teach it to anyone anytime scythe um it is probably a, i know it's in my top five at least but it is a great game that does a, a uh, good job of resource management you think it's a war game it is not a war game it is but a it resource management game if you play it like a war game eh, have fun have fun yeah try to win it that way might be able to um but it's a great game uh and that is of course a stone Meyer game mm -hmm. uh brings us to five my uh five for me is alhambra um i'll have to look up who designed alhambra uh durkheim uh alhambra is it's one of those gateway games that kind of gets lost i mean everybody knows ticket to ride everybody knows Catan. everybody knows carcassonne Alhambra kind of gets lost in the shuffle. It's a queen. It's a yellow box game. Queen puts all her stuff in yellow boxes, and I think they all kind of blend together at a point. But in Alhambra, you're making your palace, or Alhambra, and you can, you're can you dealing with four different craftsmen, and they only want to be paid in their currency. So on your turn, you're grabbing cards, and you can pay these the, the different craftsmen for buildings to add to your Alhambra, but you don't only pay in their currency. However, if you pay them exact change... You get another turn. Now, buildings will not re refill until after you've uh, passed your turn and moved on to the next player. And then when you're building your Alhambra, open spaces can touch open spaces. Walled section can touch walled sections. And when the scoring cards come up, you get points based on who has the most of each type of building. From, like, the arcades to the fountains to the, uh, uh, the towers. And then, uh, oh, the... the Oh, the gardens yeah. and all that. And then your point, one point for each second section of your lowest continuous outer wall. I love playing Alhambra. It's one of those games after you've taught people and once they see you do the exact change, then they start gobbling up cards mm -hmm. ready to set up their ex exact change mechanism. Right. It's not an engine builder except for you can build an engine on a turn to take four or five buildings at the same time. And people just feel good about that interaction. I think that it's one of the... I think it's just a, a step above a gateway game. Because when you, I see you teach it, people think that they've got it. And then once they play, you're like, well, you can't play that there because you've got open space next mm -hmm. to wall. And they're like, oh. And I, when we play through the game, I think that's the one game where I see people go, oh, I get it now. Uh, more than any other game. But yeah, I love me some Alhambra. Catherine, five. Um, well, I've already said it once. We'll go with another Stonemeyer Viticulture. Mm -hmm. Viticulture is probably the easiest worker placement game, I think, because you have, and I always equate Viticulture and Tuscany as the exact same game, whatever. Um, 
So if I say Viticulture, I'm probably saying Tuscany Mm because I prefer Tuscany. Um, But you're playing the the worker down to get the thing or to do the thing. And you're planting vines to harvest grapes, to crush, to fill wine orders. And it just all makes so much sense. So it's a great intro into worker placement games for um, newbies, I think. And from my copy, I would I'll almost always play with Tuscany as well. Exactly. But if somebody has a brand new copy and wants to be taught, I'll sit down and teach them basic sure. culture and have a great time with it. Sure, absolutely. It's a great game. Mm-hmm. Uh, that brings us to number four. Uh, number four for me is patchwork. Um, first time I taught this is we were doing a patchwork tournament at a meta games mm-hmm. and we all had broken up into different sections and um, I had to teach like two or three people who came in just they're like oh I, I've never played this but I want to be in the tournament and I was like okay well there's some important things you need to know mm-hmm. but it ended up being a, a fairly easy teach because you know you've got those Tetris type pieces and you're like make them fit together and cover as much board as you can because at the end of the game any open spaces are negative points everybody gets that you know that mechanism you know and then you just got to teach them how to go around the board and so it's an easy teach for a game that provides a lot of fun Mm -hmm. number four Catherine. um hanabi hanabi is probably one of my better filler games that i don't play enough Mm -hmm. um it's a cooperative game it is a memory game so some people don't like that but um it's fun because you can't look at your own cards and so uh playing with people it's really that it's a great Mm -hmm. team build so if you have a small office and you have four or five people that you need to do a team build with bring out some hanabi because (laughs) it is a great communication tool builder um and i did look up who hanabi was by because we were talking about that so i will tell you it is by um antoine boza antoine boza yeah boza there you go Let's see here. That brings us to three, if I'm not mistaken, because that's how counting works. Uh, For me, the mind. I absolutely love the teach on the mind because I teach it twice. The first time you put down, you give everybody their cards, and then you tell them to play and tell them basically the the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. Everybody plays their card when they think it should be played. And there's that little thing, and, and in the mind, you each round is how many cards you get. So round one, everybody gets one card. Round two, everybody gets two cards, and it gets harder and harder. You have so many lives that each time you play a bad play, you lose a life. You have a throwing star that you can throw out there, and everybody gets rid of their lowest card, gives you little information. But you don't really... Te- I don't really teach people the... the. It's kind of magic that first time. Because mm-hmm. everybody doesn't exactly know it, and then once you play it, all right, what we really want to do is get our mind clocks on the same page... So in your mind, maybe start doing one one thousand, two one thousand, and then put the car where you are, so you can get everybody's clocks on the same page. I've won it one time with four players. All the way up. Yes. That's impressive. Then we played hardcore, and we got three rounds in before we died. <laughs> <laughs> but the mind is one of those aha moments when, especially for newbies, mm-hmm. when you play not only a co-op because a lot of people aren't into co-ops mm-hmm. until they get to modern board gaming, but that. Whenever you go through, like, round three or four, you feel like you have so many cards, and when you go flawless and you flip them over, mm-hmm. with, in hardcore, you play them face down, and you don't know until you flip them over. So, when, and when we had all our minds, round two, everything was perfect. And then round three was <laughs> a you-know-what show. <laughs> but that is designed by Wolfgang Warsh. And that is the mind at number three. Catherine, your three? Uh, brass. I which one? You know, no, oh, I'm sorry. The classic, like Lancashire. Yes, I I don't like beer. In brass or in real life, anyway. <laughs> um, so brass is a classic. Um, what's his face? Wallace. Yes. Um, I love brass because it is um. The, the multi-use card thing that you're doing. It's network building. It's resource management. It's everything I love my games to be. And it is a punishing game that I love. Um, it, and I like teaching it, especially to people who are ready to take a toe dip into a little bit of a heavier thinky game, um, an economic game that 
does its own unique thing. So exposing people and kind of getting them and pushing them into a more uh, complicated game is very rewarding. Yeah. Brings us to two. Andrea, what's two? Uh, mine is uh, Splendor Marvel. Um, I love teaching it because normally people want to play it because they're fans of the uh, Marvel comics or their universe Mm -hmm. or the movies and that makes it so much easier to teach when you're like you need to get one of all five infinity stones and whoever has the most avengers on their team gets extra points and everybody's like yeah i get that yeah (laughs) so that really helps to teach and it also is very almost comic based in the cards because each one of the cards is a different marvel character and you're trying to get the characters that you like in your team so you might not win the game but man you got iron man and captain america and you know the scarlet witch on your team you're like i got a great avengers team (laughs) so i was when my brother plays you know he's just happy to get his favorite characters played you know whether he wins or not you know that's a bonus he sure did so it's fun to watch the other players enjoy the the theme it makes it fun Catherine, you too uh glass road Um, It is a very unique Uwe that um, fantastic resource management wheel. Um, People get like everyone who plays it, that resource management wheel. It's like, oh, this is really cool. I get it now. Mm -hmm. It's like making the glass and the brick from um, increasing your resources makes sense because now I have one of everything I need for glass. Mm -hmm. Now glass is going to be made. Um, and it's just, it's a quick game for an Uve. Uh, you don't have to feed your people for an Uve. Um, so it's not quite as painful, but it's painful in its own right with the resource management aspect of it. But it's, it's very interesting. And then the other fun part about Glass Road is learning to play, especially if you play with the same people over and over again, you kind of get their strategy, which means mm-hmm. you can modify your strategy a little bit and you can, um, change how you play based on who you're playing with uh, that changes the dynamics of the game as well. Sure. So that brings us to number one. Um, my number one, I'm right with Catherine, with Scythe by Jamie Stegmeier. I love the teach. I love giving everybody the pieces. Look on your map. You see those mechs. You don't get them yet, but as soon as you start building them, you get to do more things. And then here are the base rules for everybody. You take your little pawn, you move it to a different section on your player board, you try and do the top, and then you can do the bottom. You can do either or, but you must do the top before the bottom. The one part I, I always, and maybe it's everybody, is the follow action, your enlist. Mm. It's the hardest one to get people to grasp, but it's one of the most important ones for two or three factions. If you don't do the enlisting, you're not using that faction to its full potential. Right. Mm. But most people walk away and go, wow, that was a really good game. It's an instant experience. Right. I mean, because really, the best thing about Scythe is it's you are immersed in a alternate reality that it really, even though it's a very simple mechanic-wise game, it it feels very immersive. And it feels very fleshed out. Yeah. It's a fantastic I feel fantastic like so game. much love went into every aspect of mm-hmm. it. Art to pieces to lore mm-hmm. to just about everything. Have you played Expeditions yet? Nope. Okay. We'll have to do that sometime. Sometime. Okay. (laughs) Catherine, you're number one. Uh, Of course, it's going to be a Feld. Mm -hmm. uh, Bruges. Um, And I'm going to say Bruges over Hamburg because I've only played Hamburg a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And I am one that... um, It's a purist, I guess. Whatever. I like the classics. I like the... Don't streamline anything for me. Like, just give me the game. Um, Bruges is... Outside of Glory to Rome, I think the best use of a multi-use card. So you're taking a card and you're using it for one of six different things. A building, the person, to get peoples, to get rid of a threat, to build a canal. Get money. To get money. Six, six things. things. Um, so you're using it for one of those six things. You are building a house to put people into, which are the cards, which means you can do some engine building. Or you can focus on canals and just go straight victory points. Um, the one thing to remember, Steve, money is not a strategy. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> uh, 
instead of honorable mentions, maybe a game you can teach but you'd rather not, or a game that you like to teach that you kind of fallen out of love of teaching. Hmm. One for me is Concordia. I used to love teaching the game, but there's mm. so many expansions and there's so many things. Unless it's just base Concordia, and I don't necessarily like playing just base Concordia. Hmm. I would rather play with people that knew most of it, where I only had to teach the little expansions we're throwing in there. Mm. But having to teach from scratch Concordia, then the fish market, and salt... I don't really want to... And, and I don't know if that's because I've played so much Concordia. Mm -hmm. But. Hmm, interesting. Hmm. I don't know about that. A game that I will teach but would rather not. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, that's, that's a game I've fallen out of love of teaching. Oh, okay. Because if you would have asked me, if I would have had this subject two years ago, Concordia would have been, been up there. there. It's right. still my favorite game. Although it's kind of lost some of its footing. And not because it's a bad game, it's just because I played the crap out of it. Well, and the, I think some games can get too many expansions. Like, I wonder if Concordia needs to, I don't know, stop expanding. If it was just maps, I'd be happy. Right, yeah, stop with If it with did a, the same thing with Power Grid? Yeah, yeah, just give me more maps, that's fine. Yeah. Like um, Age of Steam, here's another map. Right. Sweet. Yeah. Here's some weird maps. Awesome. So, Age of Steam, actually, now that you say that. Age of Steam, I love. Mm-hmm. I never want to teach it. Gotcha. It's it's way. Um, I just don't think I'll ever. the The hard part, and this is with all eighteen XXs with me, is that I understand how to play the game. I understand um, the mechanics and what you're trying to accomplish. I understand the theme of it. I get all of it. For some reason, I have a disconnect in my brain for counting the links and knowing the routes. Gotcha. Like to this day, and I've played probably at least three dozen times 18xx and or steam together i still have other people count the links for me i'm just like nope you guys got to do this i'm not doing it <laughs> andrea a game you can teach that you don't like to or a game that you used to like to teach that you don't like as much um i know you hinted about it earlier but wingspan Mm -hmm. is a game I was convinced I knew how to teach. I'm like, no, Rick, I don't need any help teaching you. Go play that game over there. Come on, friends, I'll teach you Wingspan. I sat down, I got it all set up, and then I was like, uh, you know. <laughs> Rick, get, I Rick, need, friends Rick, and I need your help. How, how many cards do we start with? Because, and I think part of that is my first time I played it, I got taught wrong. Mm -hmm. I thought we were taught we got to five cards and five um, oh, resources, yeah. not five total. So then I was like, wait, which was it? And then, you know, then the then the self-doubt kicked in. Yeah. And then I was like. Now you're questioning everything. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's like, someone help me. <laughs> so yeah, help. for a simple game that everyone loves and plays, I, I, I'll let someone else teach that one. Catherine, thank you for coming on. Sure, anytime. We'll see you next year at Moon City Con. We have some announcements probably coming up in the next 411s and the Moon City Minutes. And blah, blah, blah. But until then, we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. The 417 Gamer Podcast is recorded and produced by Rick Bagwell and Andrea Smith. We would like to thank Catherine for coming by and talking about games with us. The music we use for our podcast, Kind, Gentle, Beautiful Person, and Making Up for Lost Time was created by Origami Replica. For links to the songs and show notes, head over to the Facebook page on at Hobby Gaming Network. And until then, keep gaming in the 417.